Hi, Peter. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Good. Excellent. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcast. You're Peter Beinert. I uh, used to be editor of the New Republic. I actually knew you at the New Republic a little before you were editor. Um, and now you write for the Atlantic. You teach, I guess, at what? Um, City University of New York? You teach yeah. journalism? And, yeah, and uh, yeah. you've written books and stuff. You, you, what we're going to talk about is you just wrote a big piece for the Atlantic where you lay out a bold foreign policy vision after laying out a sweeping diagnosis of what's wrong with American foreign policy. Am I overstating the case so far, Peter? Uh, yeah, I mean... Okay, I, good. Let's leave it overstated, though. More people will watch. Now, okay, right. go ahead. Qualify. Qualify. <laughs> That's the New Republic way. Yeah, I learned... Yeah, we learned it at the same place. So what, what, are the, what is the nuance you, uh, you would like to add? No, there's no nuance. It's just that I, there, no piece could really do justice to all the different, you know, aspects of American foreign policy. But I, I, I tried to, like, make a couple points that I felt like would maybe shake up I don't know, would be provocative in, in a conversation inside the Democratic Party on foreign policy that I feel like is kind of oddly very muted and, and stale compared to the domestic policy debate where a lot is, is changing and going on. Um, and so. Yeah, so before we get to your bold foreign policy vision and sweeping diagnosis of the ills <laughs> of American foreign policy, <laughs> let's, uh, let's see, you make it an observation at the beginning that Whereas the Democrats on domestic policy tend to critique Trump from the left, on foreign policy, they often sound like they're talking from the right. He's not tough enough on Russia. He's not tough enough on North Korea and so on, right? Right. Now, do you think that's, is it more because of where he is on foreign policy or because of where they are kind of psychologically and politically with respect to Trump, right? Like. There's this narrative, the Russians, right. or he's in cahoots with the Russians, and, all, and, and also just people are pretty much in a mood to criticize whatever he does, and right. you've got to find somewhere to criticize, and in some cases with foreign policy, it's hard to move to the left of where he is on some parts of foreign policy. Right. So why do you think, why do you think it is that they're, that they're hitting him from the right? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is that just, that's where his jaw is open in some ways. I mean, on the Russia stuff, he seems, um, you know, I think it starts with, the Russia meddling in the election, right? That's where the kind of the, that's the North Star for the Democrats, right? They feel like, and I agree with them that Trump, Trump is kind of not doing enough to protect us against that, try to make the Russians not do that. And so I think from there, they kind of extrapolate to more broadly to kind of the view that like Russia's really bad and we really got to be tough against them everywhere. And then I think on the North Korea thing, I think it's, it's kind of partly, um, it's probably just a kind of an establishmentarian view that like Trump is, which is like, a lot of truth that like Trump is an amateur, doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Like he's screwing this up. But I also think it's a kind of partly this thing from the Iran deal. It's kind of like, wait a second, we got bashed so much on the Iran deal, but like we actually, Obama was kind of pretty tough on the Iran deal. And, and now you're basically kicking us in the teeth on the Iran deal, but you're actually proving much more of a dupe than he ever did. So I think it's on the North Korea, I think it's partly, but I think in some ways it's a whole series of responses which don't really add up to the question of kind of like trying to think about kind of what Democrats actually really believe and that Trump has kind of scrambled these conversations in ways that I think should make the Democrats actually think more systematically rather than just basically trying to kind of bop him where he seems vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Now, he hasn't in all respects scrambled things the way you might have guessed based on his campaign rhetoric, right? So on foreign policy, where would you say he has stayed true to the maverick in him? And where would you say he's been kind of captured by the Republican foreign policy establishment, if, if anywhere? Right. So if you quit the question of like, what would Marco Rubio be doing and what would Marco Rubio not be doing? Um, mm -hmm. I think that North Korea stand and Russia probably stand out and trade as the things where I think he's broken. But on uh, Russia, he's been I mean, isn't isn't aren't they supplying arms to and and, 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 and there's various sanctions and so on. I mean, in terms of actual substance, how. Right. So this is also just right. This is just the kind of the weirdness of this moment. Right. In the sense that, like, what makes the Trump administration different than the Rubio administration is that presumably Marco Rubio himself would be more plugged into what was happening in a Rubio administration. Whereas with Trump, it's this kind of like head disconnected from a body. Uh, right. So you're right. In a way, the permanent foreign policy bureaucracy, he's not really 
brought in people who would, on trade he has perhaps, brought in people who kind of buttress his own iconoclastic instincts. On Russia, he hasn't, either because, I don't know, he just not, he hasn't thought about enough or work, he, he hasn't, he hasn't, he could have gone to the Cato Institute and maybe found some kind of guys like that, but he actually has brought in people like John Bolton and Popeo who are pretty hawkish, so you're right. They kind of continue the hawkishness, and then you get this really weird question of kind of like, what is American foreign policy? What actually matters? The stuff that we're doing or the stuff that Trump says? So if, if Trump is kind of, you know, saying he wants a great relationship with Russia and they should be invited back into the G7 and kind of kicking our NATO partners, but also sending things, imposing sanctions, which is not even clear that he knew he was imposing and then seemed like he was pissed off about it afterwards. It's just this really, really incoherent mess. But I think Rubio would be in a much more coherent way more coherently hawkish and probably taking a harder line around the election stuff because Trump is such an egomaniac that it's like he can't acknowledge the election stuff was real because that undermines he thinks that undermines the legitimacy. I think oh, Rubio would probably say, of course I'm legitimate, but this is a really big problem. We're going to make sure it doesn't happen. Again. And similarly, I mean, Rubio would have the troops, American troops in Syria, conceivably more of them, but you wouldn't be getting these reports that he actually doesn't want them there, which is what you get with Trump. He's got them there, but in his heart, he doesn't want them there. Right. I think where he's most consistent, you know, on, on, on the Middle East generally, on Iran, I think, he's, that's a pretty orthodox, seems like Republican play. He, now, maybe a, a more thoughtful and, and responsible Republican wouldn't have quite ripped up the Iran deal as he did, but the generally kind of like, get in really tight, no daylight with the Gulf states, no daylight with Israel, and basically be as tough as you possibly can on Iran. I kind of feel like that's probably where um, other Republicans would have gone to, and also on Israel and the Palestinians. Um, I think, interestingly, he's backing, he starts out really hard line on China on trade, but he seems to be also, which maybe Rubio wouldn't do, but he seems to be becoming pretty hard line on the national security stuff with China too, which maybe Rubio would have done. Right. Now, on Iran, that was kind of the one exception from his, uh, what some people called his isolationism. Even in the campaign, he was like hating on Iran, partly because the deal was associated with Obama. So in a way, the antagonism with Iran isn't such a surprise. On the other hand, one thing that it's kind of related to and, and to some extent joined to, which is the deep embrace of Bibi Netanyahu in Israel is something at the very beginning of his campaign you might not have predicted. There were some real concerns in the pro in the right wing pro-Israel community, right? He was saying things like, well, we should look at things in a balanced way on Israel Palestine. That was like freaking them out, right? So that is a that is a change, right? Yeah, I mean I, I guess my view is that if you look at the people that he surrounded with himself on this issue, right? I mean, um it's really there was there was never really much of a chance, I think, given the people he's put, especially because he put in Bolton, but not just Bolton. I mean, Jared Kushner, you know, and 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 Jason oh, David uh, Friedman, David Friedman. I mean, it's really what it is. Is in some ways just a caricature of a of a standard Republican position, right? Which yeah. is what what Donald Trump did is basically said Israel. Okay, well, my 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 real my my real estate lawyer is Jewish, and my bankruptcy lawyer is Jewish, right? And my son-in-law is Jewish. They. I'm sure they care a lot about Israel. Let's put them in charge of it. You know, um, so it's kind of in some ways I, like... No I don't think we should overlook the money, Peter. Does the name Sheldon Adelson mean yes, anything? Yes, that's right. And Sheldon Adelson would have, would have had a lot of influence with any Republican uh, president, 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 but in a weird way, because I think Trump got so isolated and some other big Republican donors dissed him, Adelson became even more important. And also because Trump is just more nakedly transactional. So the other Republican president might say, well... Adelson really wants us to move the embassy in Jerusalem, but I've got these guys from the State Department who are telling us the King of Jordan is really upset about it. Um, maybe I'll weigh that. Whereas Trump's like, mm -hmm. screw the King of Jordan. Right? Like, I mean, Trump is just basically, he's not fettered by the normal procedures. So I think it's a kind of caricature of what you would see under a Rubio or some other Republican. Yeah, that, that's that's the news flash from today. Trump is not fettered by normal procedures. I think we can agree <laughs> on that as an across the board characterization. <laughs> Um, so, uh, okay. So now, now, so you say, but, but the Democrats in hitting Trump in the right in foreign policy, you say in the piece, and I want to, I want to interrogate you about this. They are moving away from their base because all the energy is on the left. You know, you've got these socialists and so on, but I can, I always ask the question, how many people in anybody's base really care about foreign policy? If there aren't like body bags coming home with Americans in them, 
how many Democratic voters, uh, it's certainly true that, you, you, you know, some of the kind of elites on the socialist left are talking a little, a little about foreign policy, but how many voters on, on, on the, in the Democratic Party actually care? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, foreign policy has always been more of an elite driven element of American government than domestic policy, where foreign policy elites have had more uh, more insulated. And one of the ways in which you really see this, I think, really dramatically is in how you know, the Democratic Party has become a more multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, whatever party where women play a lot of, you know, influence, have a lot of influence. But the foreign policy kind of community remains extremely white, pretty male, and it, 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 it is much more disconnected. But I think that, so it's interesting, if you look at, if you compare foreign policy elites to economic policy elites, I think one of the really fascinating things is like, it, it wasn't too long ago that the best way to get a really good job in, in making economic policy in a democratic administration was to be a budget hawk who worked in Wall Street, right? And now things have shifted in the Democratic Party enough that that's actually pretty, probably a pretty bad way to get a job probably in the next democratic administration given the way things are going. Um, on foreign policy, we, it hasn't gotten there yet, but I do think that um, even though there's a, the, even though people are more insulated, there the, the kind of there's a gener the, the rising activist tide inside the Democratic Party, at least on certain things. So, for instance, the Democrats almost all voted for the big increase in the military budget. Mm -hmm. um, um, I would suspect that that will become harder in the years to come. Um, as, um, as there's more of a sense that people are looking over your shoulder and, and there's more of a kind of sense that you could potentially, I mean, look, it wasn't too long ago that the notion that you could get primary from your left in the Democratic Party was really not something you'd have to worry about at all. And now you have this sense that certainly if you live, if you're in a blue district, like that, that is conceivable. And if you, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez didn't make this, you know, front and center of her campaign, but she and the networks of people that she's connected to do have a set of views on this, which are pretty left. And Bernie Sanders is going out there, um, mm -hmm. I think, with a much, much more, a more well-developed and more progressive view on foreign policy than he had in 2016. And I think that's true. Better in 2020. Yeah, no, he's one of the most interesting candidates on foreign policy that we've seen in a long time now, I think. He's, he's filling a space that just has not been filled by pretty much anybody to speak right. of. Since like Jesse Jackson, basically, right? Yeah. So, um, okay, so one thing you, you, a point you make in diagnosing uh, the problems with American foreign policy is that, you know, it, it's sometimes people speak as a kind of a shorthand that like, well, Democrats are becoming like, you know, cold warriors all of a sudden in contrast to Trump. But then, but the point you make is actually the Cold War per se was a relatively in some ways restrained and realist period in American foreign policy. I mean, realist in the, in the sense of foreign policy terminology. Um, and, you know, I mean, we, we, we didn't mess with Russia on the, on the margins unnecessarily. Eisenhower said, tough luck to the freedom fighters in Hungary or whatever. We're not getting involved. And, and now Vietnam was involvement, it is safe to say. But still, there was a lot of caution and realism. And then you make the point that, like, once the Cold War ended, first George Bush established a bigger footprint in the Middle East after the Persian Gulf War. Clinton expanded NATO. Then we expanded uh, um, into, not, not just into Eastern Europe, but actually into the former Soviet Union. There are parts of former Soviet Union that are, that are into NATO. You, you talk about, so talk about, well, first of all, talk about some of the downside of all of this, as you see, and maybe now you can get to your generic core diagnosis of the problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my basic look, and I should also say, you know, and you and I both have history at the New Republic, and you were probably wiser about some of these. The, the views that, I'm, that I express, these are not the views that I always held, you know. Um, Famously uh, so. By the way, I want to compliment you on one thing, an index entry in the book you wrote after the Iraq War. Uh, you were editor when the, when, the New York, when the New Republic championed the Iraq War. And in one of your books, if you go to the index, it says, Iraq War, comma, author's mistaken support of. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I feel like, um, you know, 10, you know, 15 years after the Iraq War, in a lot of ways for me, that's not just the war, but but the whole ethos that I, you know, of the 1990s and the, you know, T and I was uh, the interventions in the Balkans, the Gulf War, all of these things, which were very formative experiences to me. A lot of my thinking about foreign policy and my still wrestling with it is trying to trying to step back and think about what what was going on in the United States and why I think I was susceptible to some very 
think, hubristic notions about America and America's role in the world. Um, I think that, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed and there was a vacuum. Um, and America, America basically moved to fill that vacuum in a lot of places. Um, and um, the notion was, well, you know, our power will go, will go in and our ideals will go along with it and the world will become better. And there were places where, um, where there was clearly a lot of progress as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. But I think what happened in the 1990s is that an older set of debates about American interests got lost because the, the conversation that had really started in the 30s and continued to the 80s had to do with which parts of the world were so important to the United States that we needed to make sure that no, no adversary could dominate them. And once there was no adversary on the horizon, basically every, we just moved to fill the gap basically everywhere that, that was not already, that was not spoken for. And I think what happened is that a, a, a discourse emerged in which essentially the expansion of America's footprint, the expansion of American hegemony became a kind of good in and of itself. Um, there were still some, you know, rear guard actions. We need to fight against the bad guys who were still there in, in Iran, North Korea, Iraq. And what happened, and I think this is kind of what paved the way for Trump, and Trump was only the last and tragically most successful in a series of kind of insurrections that took place from across the political spectrum. I mean, from Ross Perot in the weird center to Ralph Nader and Jerry Brown in the weird left to, you know, to Pat Buchanan on the kind of anti-Semitic right, uh, racist anti-Semitic right. Basically all, I think, saying, like, what is, what's in this for us? Like, what, what is the ordinary American actually getting out of this, you know? And I think that that's a question that is kind of that the people who do foreign policy have gotten out of the habit of asking. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, if, if there's one thing that's, come, that's valuable out of Trump's crazy, immoral, amoral, idiotic, ignorant, whatever, is that in some ways he put that center, he put that question front and center. And I think it creates, for Democrats, I think that the, the, the opportunity and the obligation is to reorient American foreign policy around that question. It's no longer like, well, how far can we push NATO? Can we like get it as far as, as far east as possible, you know, and then taking on more obligations? The question seems to me is like, how does this actually you know, the, this term of Lippmann's that I use in the piece is shield of the republic. So basically, how does this create an international environment which gives ordinary Americans the best chance of being prosperous and free? And I think we've gotten away from that kind of conversation. Yeah. And for our younger viewers, Walter Lippmann was a founder of the New Republic. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, I just realized, particularly in reading your piece, I really don't, I mean, you've said it was, you've depicted it as a kind of a reflex just to kind of keep expanding, but I don't really understand why the impetus was so strong. I mean, it's funny, I was listening to a podcast, an Intercept, uh, Intercepted podcast, Jeremy Scahill was interviewing Noam Chomsky, and of course, Chomsky tends to see it as kind of a, they're a grand imperial design, you know, great powers, you know, there aren't many accidents here, we're always trying to secure more territory and control more stuff, and at the time, I thought, you know, Sometimes, but I think sometimes shit just happens and it's, and it's like, but, but, uh, but on the other hand, when I read your piece and kind of saw how in a way systematic the post Cold War expansion was, you know, again, Bush, you know, leaving those bases in the Middle East after the Persian Gulf War, the expansion of NATO to the, per, to the perimeter of the Soviet Union and then beyond what what was the political impetus for this stuff? Was it different in different cases? I mean, you heard about like Polish American voters with the expansion of NATO, but that doesn't, is that, is that that big? A, you know, what, what, what do you see? I think partly that just there was nothing on the other side. So it was considered to be essentially no downside. The sense in the nineties when the Soviet Union was so weak and flat on their back that they weren't going to cause us any trouble. There was a domestic politics element too. And look also small countries uh, on the border of great other of other great powers right it's not no surprising that they would find the idea of a military alliance with the united states really attractive i mean mm -hmm. you know i mean look i mean the morally the things don't I'm, I'm not suggesting a moral analogy but strategically like there's a reason that the cubans were kind of interested in, the, in an alliance with the soviet union right because they had a history of being invaded by the united states right. so like they so in a way that that makes sense right um that, that we could provide them a kind of protection if you, that, that, as the great power far away I think that what was lost in that in that whole period was this question of like, are the American people, are, are we writing checks that the American people are really going to allow us to cash here, 
Like as we go forward, as this kind of this the Amer America pushes further and further out, um, especially because you know, except for a brief period in the, in maybe in the late '90s, things are not necessarily getting better for ordinary Americans. So it's not like Americans are associating America's kind of march out into the world. And so you see presidential candidate after presidential candidate, even like John Kerry in 2004, is basically saying, hey, well, why aren't we doing spending this money at, here at home, you know? And that kind of gets, you know, kind of derided as a little bit isolationist, but it's partly a response to this feeling that I think Americans are saying that, wait a second, there's a disconnect between the fortunes of the American empire and the fortunes of me. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has... What um, that I think needs to be put back at the center of American foreign policy. Yeah, and Trump kind of put it in the conversation after which he proceeded to pass the biggest defense budget in history, right? Right, right, exactly. So Trump kind of, I think, raises the question, and I, you know, but then you're right, there's not, there's nothing really, it's not coherent there. And also, Trump has a, I mean, Trump has his own, also has a kind of zero sum view of the world, right? Which makes, I think, it hard for him to really think in terms of cooperation. With, yeah. There's kind of like a very strong unilateralist streak there. Right. So, and then as you know, we, you know, we got into a certain amount of trouble by kind of pushing on the periphery of, of, the, of the former Soviet Union, sometimes Russia itself. So there was the whole thing with Georgia during the Bush administration and then Ukraine. Uh, well, you don't depict Ukraine as us pushing so much. I actually wanted to ask you about that. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, you 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 say that in Ukraine some protesters led to a new president or something, but I think the actual perception in Russia was that America was kind of fiddling around in Ukraine. And in fact, I've heard that um, this is one thing that kind of pushed Putin over the edge and made him determined to mess with America in its in its election. But but don't I mean don't you think there there was a perception and to some extent a reality that we were kind of you know I mean we weren't supplying them with weapons, yeah. but you know. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I think we're having in a certain kind of way the same kind of debate now about Russia um, that, that historians had about the beginning of the Cold War, which is on the one, you know, the, the kind of the standard orthodox view is this, the Cold War was inevitable because the Soviets were totalitarian. And so they were always going to try to basically be hostile to the democratic world and try to push and try to undermine our governments. And we had to stand fast against them. The revisionist view, which starts to emerge, you know, in the 60s and 70s, is actually we're really threatening them. We're not really giving them any kind of security perimeter in their area. And that that's actually so I think in a weird way, in a way, we're kind of in that discussion now with Russia in terms of the kind of like who lost Russia question. Right. Is it like is it basically that Putin, because he's a bad guy and an authoritarian, is inevitably going to go out and basically try to undermine democracies around the world? Or if we had not threatened him so much, if we had basically um, not been seen by him as basically trying to overthrow him and his client in the regimes close by, or is he so paranoid that he would have believed that no matter what we did? I, I can, look, there are a lot of empirical questions here that I, that I don't, I cannot answer, but I do, I start from the, from the view that, and again, this is a point that Lippmann made, is that we, we have a general tendency in the United States to assume that know that that spheres of influence for great powers are completely illegitimate except for us right. um and i think as a and, and that's often kind of even as an it's an unstated kind of thing but it just goes without saying right um it kind of goes without saying that mexico that we should have control over mexico's foreign policy to some degree right and i mean the monroe doctrine is not being questioned right um and and i think that's that that once you accept the idea that not that it's a love, not that it's a good thing, right? It was not a, you know, what is the, the Mexican blames, you know, poor Mexico, so, so, so far from God, so close to the United States. Like, I mean, it's not been great in many ways for Latin America, and it's certainly not great if you're Vietnam or if you're Ukraine or Georgia. But I think that the problem with the conversation, which doesn't acknowledge this, is that it gets America into situations where even at the moment, where we can't win, because they're all, these countries just, these places matter more to these great powers than they do to us. And so ultimately, we, not even doing the people who live on the borders of Russia and China, I think really any favors, you know? Um, and I think this is a part of the 
conversation that is, is, not, is hard to have in American, in American foreign policy circles. And what's funny is after you do a series of things that drive the Russians nuts and things, I mean, including, I don't think you mentioned this, but bombing Kosovo really, really bothered them. Right. And Libya bothered Libya them. Libya really bothered them. Right. Messing in Georgia, what they perceived messing in the Ukraine, uh, the, the whole expansion of NATO, which they thought they'd gotten an oral guarantee would not happen. Uh, after all that happens, they do push back a little. They do, uh, you know, Crimea and so on. And then people say, see, we were right. We had to expand NATO. Well, it's actually not clear, had you not done all these things like expanding NATO that they saw as provocations, that we would be in these particular messes. Um, yeah, so no, I, I, I think you're right. I think it's, it's not. And I think that, you know, it's interesting to go back and see how a lot of people in the mid 90s, people who we don't think of as left wingers, actually kind of pillars of the establishment like Kennan and like John Lewis Gaddis, were worried basically that they basically said, look, Russia's not always going to be this weak. Um, and if you if you basically take it maximum advantage of their weakness now, it may come back to bite you in a form of particularly kind of nasty kind of Russian nationalism. Um, and I think, you know, again, like I'm, I'm, I'm not of the view that Russia meddling in the election is irrelevant. I think that actually like it's a pretty important principle that Americans should determine American elections, not Russians or anybody else. But it's striking to me how little conversation we have this. I didn't really write about this in this piece, but like we we you can't even come out and say, OK, how about this? The Russians don't meddle in our in, in our elections and we don't meddle in foreign elections either. Mm -hmm. Or these are the set of ground rules that determine what we do. Right. Like that conversation rarely happens. And I well, think it's, like, it's that I think is part of the problem. Because you will get stigmatized if you say, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think you'll get stigmatized. I think there's just a there's a I mean, there's is a weird on the one hand, there's kind of like the assumption that America is naturally virtuous. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, which, uh, but then on the other hand, with especially with conservatives, then they'll flip it and it'll be like, no, we're not naturally virtuous, but like it's a dog eat dog world, and we got to do whatever we need to do to survive. But I, th I think the question is, it's one. I think we. I just don't even think that the principle that we're defending in terms of what Russia did is entirely clear. Like, is the clear? Is the, is it that you don't interfere? Is it just a sovereignty question, or is it that like? Is it, pro is it problematic because they intervened on behalf of one candidate? What if they had just taken out ads in the newspaper saying like, uh, you know, um, vote for Donald Trump because uh, we don't want a new Cold War with you? Like, yeah, I still haven't seen a good comparison or a good account of the various ways America has intervened in various elections, including Russia's, including Ukraine's. I mean, in some sense of the word intervene, not necessarily some gravely illicit sense, but I, I just haven't seen good journalism on it. No, and, and, and the other thing is that I think, and I think this is actually an important point for Democrats to, to try to make, is that, you know, a much of, this is an old story since World War II, but much of what, our, what happens is secret, right? I mean, we have, uh, we have a very large national security apparatus that, where we don't have very good oversight of what's, nece of what's happening, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in the, set, the last time we did a real deep dive into this in the 1970s after Vietnam with the Church Commission, they found all kinds of hair-raising stuff was happening. So one of the things I think Democrats could, that would really be valuable for Democrats to do is to really talk about reestablishing really serious oversight so that we, do we know which countries, do we know what the U.S. is doing in Venezuela? I mean, we see little skip it that maybe we had a meeting with some, with, some, with some generals, but we really don't know these things. And I think that's part of what makes the debate hard to have. Yeah. Well, I think you're right that, I mean, again, you're, you, what, your foreign policy is in many ways a realist foreign policy, which is to say, among other things, there's going to be less military intervention in the name of ideals and less in the name of human rights. And, and, and for that reason, it gets stigmatized as immoral. But a point you do make, which I've been trying to make, is like, you know, when big wars happen, that's kind of bad, too, because a bunch of people die and lose relatives and spend the rest of their lives with no legs and stuff and have to become refugees. And that counts in the moral calculus. I mean, yes. and, and, and so if you've got a foreign policy that at least purports to lead to less war, you cannot call that an inherently immoral or amoral foreign policy. You can say it's wrong and they won't really prevent war, but, you, you know, well, uh, you get the picture. No, I mean, if you, if you look at the, the visions you know, around the creation of the United Nations, right? I mean, one of the things that was really important to those people was preventing aggressive wars. That's, Absolutely. Um, and, and I think that, that, you know, and and so, and I also, the other point I tried to make in the piece is that it's not 
just that when you launch the war, you know, maybe the war will, uh, maybe this kind of intervention will be good for people's human rights. I mean, maybe you could argue in Kosovo, maybe. It's a, but, but there's also the possibility that a Cold War has a lot of costs to it. One of the things is it makes cooperation harder. Right. And so there's a lot of stuff that we really need. We're not going to solve the civil war in Syria or in Afghanistan. We're not going to solve those without actually us and the Russians kind of, you know, working out some kind of a deal. Um, mm. and, the, the, and Cold Wars also produce can have produce a lot of very negative consequences domestically, um, which which we saw as well um, in terms of the you know influence on civil liberties in the United States. So I just think that the, this rush towards a Cold War with Russia to me, which I think Democrats are somewhat complicit in, I think may have effects, you know, and I don't also see the Democrats really challenging the, the increasing confrontation with China either, which I think is, is in many, perhaps even more dangerous at this point. Yeah, yeah, well, you, so you do get into um, China, and in both cases, you point out that one cost of an, uh, of an antagonistic relationship with Russia and China is that you're going to get less probably cooperation, and there has been real cooperation on the Iran deal and so on with both China and Russia, even even to the point of like participating in sanctions and so on. So yeah, with China, you, you, your argument's a little different. I mean, you make the point, I mean, it's, it's broadly similar, but you make the point that one distinction is China is a rising power, unlike Russia. You can expect rising powers to want a growing sphere of influence, and we basically have to accommodate ourselves to that fact, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that at least, I mean, again, a, a sphere of influence is not an infinite sphere of influence, right? I mean, we were, you know, the, the, the presidents of the Cold War basically accepted a kind of Soviet control over Eastern Europe. They weren't happy about it, but they weren't willing to go to war for it. But they were willing to go to war for West Berlin. So that's where we said we're willing to go to war for West Berlin. I think most Americans would say that Japan, you know, um, is, a, is, a, uh, is a security relationship the United States should, should maintain. Right. Um, um, uh, I do what I try to suggest. My piece does not get anywhere purport to offer in a kind of comprehensive China or Asia policy, which is something I, I wish I, you know, I wish I was able to think through coherently. But I've not have not and have am not able to. But I do think that um, it does point to a couple of places, one of which is Taiwan, where it seems to me the U.S. has commitments that the word I use in the piece are become increasingly insolvent as the power balance tips, which is to say, Taiwan is right next to China. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, 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 a part, it's a place that the Chinese see as actually part of China. And we have a kind of quasi commitment to protect it from China. And that's all well and good as long as the Chinese are okay with not calling our bluff. But if the power balance shifts, over years and decades, it seems to me, I mean, if you just look at the United States' experience and how American foreign policy changes from the late 19th into the early 20th century, as America becomes richer, our ambitions grow pretty significantly. I don't think there are a lot of Americans in the 1870s who thought the United States would be putting down insurrections in the Philippines, you know? Right. So if China follows on that trajectory, I mean, I could be wrong, but it just seems to me a better bet than not, then our position in Taiwan becomes increasingly dangerous to me from a U.S foreign policy a kind of solvency perspective right we're basically it's a bluff that once it gets called we're screwed um and i think that it's very difficult but i think it will be useful for americans to try to get ahead of that mm -hmm. and you almost uh is it too much to say that you propose a kind of a deal with china where if they'll uh be nicer to our workers in terms of you know economic policy imports exports we'll give them a freer hand in Asia, I'm sure I'm sure you'll call that an oversimplification, but there is. I mean, I think that we have to figure out as we have to figure out with Russia, we have to figure out what really matters most to us. Um, and I think, you know, for in Russia, I think the thing that matters most to us is that we get to determine our elections, not them. Um, and also, I think it's important that, they, that our that our allies also are um, that, 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 that Russia doesn't undermine the integrity of those democratic processes with China. Yeah, I think the most important thing vis-a-vis -vis China is the economic relationship with you, with our economic relationship with them and trying to make sure that you know that, that that economic relationship functions in a way that that is best for the american working and middle class and i think that matters more to the united states than um rocks in the south china sea uh it matters more to the united states than 
uh, than Vietnam, which is a country that would like to ally with us against China. Um, uh, and, and I think it matters more to the United States than Taiwan. I mean, and, and so I, again, that doesn't mean I think Trump's trade policies are all make sense, but I do think it means that one has to be willing to think about prioritizing in terms of China. And the other, the other things that working with China on global warming is really, really, really important. Um, and I think that, um, again, I don't think, I don't think that kind of conversation about what our priorities are is really playing itself out in the way I'd like to see. Okay. Um, but basically you're saying make a deal with China over Taiwan and get something for it. I mean, you're proposing a Hong Kong like arrangement where China agrees, you know, to, to, you know, to have some degree of autonomy for Taiwan. People will point out, of course, that in the long run, you just can't control that. And, and slowly there will be a kind of blurring of the lines between the two. But you're saying go ahead and do the deal while you can still get something for it. Yeah, I would say that. I would say be open to that kind of deal. I mean, the, the, the thing we want to avoid, it seems above all, is a war between China uh, and Taiwan. First of all, because it would be catas cataclysmic for the people involved and for the global economy even. But also be, it would be disastrous to the United States because it'll basically show that we were bluffing. We're not willing to go to war for Taiwan, I think, is what ultimately will happen. And, um, and that will be, I think, a really, really bad moment for American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned p the, the, the fact that on the right during the Cold War, there was a certain amount of realism and, and, and sensibleness from your point of view. I mean, even today, there's this interesting kind of convergence. Yeah. I, I mean, the people who would agree with what you're saying, I would say right now exist about equally on the left and on the right, wouldn't you? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's this, in some way, if you look at the think tank in Washington that has made the, I think, the most kind of fundamental critique of, of foreign policy over the last decade is probably the Cato Institute, um, which is kind of, you know, kind of libertarian. And I would say, I mean, it would get called isolationist. Um, I, I think that term gets thrown around a lot to kind of in a lot of really problematic ways. Um, and I wouldn't agree with them on everything. I would want a, a lot of kind of kinds of international cooperation, international agreements they might not be in favor of. But but I think you're right. The, the, the foreign policy debate is, um, uh, there are different kind of factions inside of both parties. Um, but I think in both parties, there's a kind of an elite mass split, which mm -hmm. might be more significant than the split between the two parties. And I think in both parties, the kind of the bases of the parties are probably less interventionist and more inclined towards looking at the foreign policy through the lens of, you know, what is, how is this benefiting us in terms of our actually, in terms of our daily lives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there are distinctions between the realist right and the realist left. Uh, and in fact, I wrote a piece uh, more than a decade ago for the New York Times coining the term progressive realism and arguing that it should be a real thing. And, I, and more recently, uh, The Nation did a yeah. roundup and they asked me to do something right after the election. And I did something on it then. But I would say the big difference. Um, and by the way, if you're wondering what would it take uh, to take the, the view that you've put forth here, what would you have to add to it in order to get a free progressive realist T-shirt, Peter? <laughs> have, you, have you been wondering what, what the missing ingredient is? No, well, now that you mention it. Uh, okay, well, here it is. It's an emphasis on global governance and respect for international law. And this is something that you're, there's going to be less enthusiasm for at Cato and more and and it has to do with a lot of things i mean it has to do with just seeing emerging threats like having nothing the way global governance to do something about like the biological weapons threat the, the general view that as people become more intertwined through technology there are more issues of governance that need to be addressed uh at the global level it also includes um you know, making trade agreements uh, a little more left wing, as as Trump actually did with NAFTA too. I know it's kind of fascinating, isn't it? Right? Yeah, the Democrats yeah. Are doing that would be saying that that's exactly what you want to do: incentivize, you know, try to get the Mexicans to force the Mexicans to allow labor unions. Like that's a right, and, and 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 I would say that's part of it. Although Trump simultaneously actually undermined the governance part, he has weakened some of the arbitration panels in NAFTA. That's more like probably more moves him more to the Cato side. But but then also just a respect for international law. You know, um, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, you, you, there's been there's more and more you probably seen there's more and more writing about what the foreign policy of the left should be. One thing people rarely get into is like, OK, what is the criterion for intervention? It's like 
we think we should intervene less. We think, well, you could do worse than to say, if it's illegal, don't, I mean, if you go back and look at our interventions and see which were illegal under international law, the Iraq war was, I would say, exceeding the original UN mandate in Libya, which was for protection of civilians and going for regime change, I would say that was illegal. Uh, I would say the bombing of Kosovo was illegal. Now, if you look at things that were legal, uh, Bosnian intervention, which didn't go that badly, uh, Afghanistan was legal. It did go badly. <laughs> so this is, but, but I think in terms, uh, so this will not stop all things that don't work out all that well. And, and, and occasionally it may stop me from doing something that would be a good idea. But let's face it, as a practical matter, we would do it if, if, if somebody had like a knife at our throat. We would, we would, we would resort to force. And I just think, um, Broadly speaking, nurturing the evolution of international law and respect for it is in America's interest. I mean, a rising China is one reason. Isn't it better for us if we have a world where you can work out disputes about who owns which islands and stuff in, a, in an international court, if there was the respect for international law that permitted that? Right. I mean, of course, the, the, you know, the response will be, um, you know, uh, the world is a jungle and you know, authoritarian regimes like China's and Russia's are particularly predisposed to see it as a jungle because that's even how politics is in there it, domestically, right? They don't have a, the kind of spheres of law that we have in the United States. So um, we're going to, you know, this is a kind of naive view of, of, of the world. But I, I, I mean, but I think I, I'm sympathetic to your point of view. I think that it's actually, um, uh, it's not entirely naive that you can, you can shift countries' sense of their interest to some degree. Um, and that, um, and that the you know the international legal the system that we created with in the UN, it, it was not it was not you know it's not utopia. I mean, it's still based. It's basically great power management. You've got it was five. a very realist system originally, if you right. ask me. As you said, the emphasis was on permitting trans border aggression at its founding. That was the main international security emphasis. Right, and it's really interesting. You know, I wrote a piece a while back about um, preventive war, um, and uh, there's a really interesting book by a guy at West Point actually about how about America's views of preventive war. And it goes back to this. If you look at the way Americans talked about the idea of attacking a country that didn't pose an imminent threat to you. Mm -hmm. the, in, the, in the 40s, 50s, even into the 60s, the, the minute that comp anyone suggests that, they basically, the people in high positions of government say, are you crazy? That's what the Japanese did during Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. like, we don't act that way. Like that's a core principle of American foreign policy is that you don't act, launch wars unless other unless other countries have attacked you or maybe they're right. absolutely about right. to. And we've lost a lot of that um, uh, for a variety of reasons. And I think that it's you're right. Some of that is um, some of that needs to be brought back. And and it having a conversation with international law requires to some degree challenging American exceptionalism, right? Because sure. the truth is we're inherently virtuous. Why do we need to be restrained by these international rules, right? Um, and Democrats, I think, need to. I, what what I think is exciting to me is that the Democratic Party is increasingly being made up of people who I think are less likely to believe in American exceptionalism. Which mm -hmm. is, I think, is a, American exceptionalism has always had a strong racial element to it. Um, and the more inf the Democratic Party is genuinely influenced by people whose experience of America and read of American history is different than the mythology that, that leads to the view that we have always, we're just trying to create liberty around everywhere we go. I think the more you have a willingness to kind of challenge American exceptionalism. The other thing I'd say about uh, the naivete of uh, trying to, to create a world of respect for international law and, and evolving global governance and so on is like, first of all, I think Russia and China are pretty realist. Uh, and, and, and if you can convince them that it's in their interest to abide by certain laws, they'll do it. And, and, and in fact, if you look at like the World Trade Organization, well, who is do, who's doing most to undermine respect for the norms and laws that the World Trade Organization embodies? The United States under Trump. Right. And, and if you look back in recent decades, who has done the most violating of international law with, with military, the use of military force? I would say we beat, uh, we're, we're at least tied with, with, <laughs> with Russia and we beat China. I mean, you know, it's just, which gets back to the exceptionalism point. Yeah, yeah. No, so, I, that's that's right. And and um, what I think is interesting is that polling shows that I, mean, I think the future of American exceptionalism is really is an interesting question now, because you have, first of all, the polling shows that younger Americans are much less likely to buy into those notions. Right. Um, and secondly, Donald Trump, in a certain kind of way, has also taken a kind of wrecking ball to American exceptionalism, because the idea of American mm -hmm. exceptionalism is that we should be able to do whatever we want, not just because we're the United States, but because we're good. 
because we represent universal values. And Donald Trump doesn't say that. In some ways, he's he's dispensed with that whole kind of, um, the you know, you might call it a mask or whatever. He's dispensed with that whole kind of rhetoric. And so I think it actually creates an interesting moment to maybe reopen some of these questions. Like, like do we really have to pretend that the United States is in our uniquely virtuous and that we don't do that we don't do uh, these very bad things abroad when palpably historically we do. Right. No, it's, it's uh, it has not dawned on most Americans that people in many nations feel their nations are special. <laughs> they're, they're not all necessarily right. And, and neither are we. Um, uh, they're all special in some way. Every child is special. Uh, so anyway, um, I know you got to go. But your Progressive Realism t-shirt is in the mail. Thank you. I appreciate it. That, we yeah. also give free tattoos, should you feel. Uh, totally well, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'll have to. Let's see about how it goes. Yeah, just try the t-shirt and see how that works. <laughs> see how, I, you know, I could change my mind about farm policy. I have had before, and then you it would could. Be, you could. You could, but I'm giving you a tentative. Uh, you know, I, but, I think you're headed toward the, I think you're headed toward the tribe. Looks like <laughs> to me. So people should, any, what else should they check out of yours, Peter? You're on Twitter, um, and you, you, what is it? It's at Peter Beiner? Yeah. And yeah. What, what else? Uh, what else should they read? Uh, or something? What else should they read? Uh, what have I written recently? Um, I wrote a, I don't know, what, I wrote a piece about arguing that, um, what's my most recent thing I wrote? I wrote a piece about the Kavanaugh thing, suggesting that um, actually to say that this does not show that we're in decline as a nation or as a Senate, because in the past, I f we, this woman would have gotten no hearing at all. So in some ways, like, actually, like, I mean, right. I think one of the things that I'm interested in these days in general is, like, I think a lot of the, the norms of civility are being breached. And I think the Democrats are moving in that direction, too. But we have to be careful of assuming that, like, civility is the highest virtue, right? Like, usually when things change in America, when there's progress, it doesn't usually happen in the most civil of ways. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, so that was the point I tried to make about the Kavanaugh. Thing. Okay, so they can Google that too. Yes. Well, thanks. Uh, this was fun. Let's uh, do it again. And right. uh, good luck on the, uh, on the foreign policy lobbying front. I I'm with you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Okay. See you, Peter.